Good morning. If you open to Psalm 8, that's where we're going to begin this morning in Psalm 8. And as we gather around the Lord's table this morning, I would like us to ponder the magnitude of the fact that God died for you. And if this lesson sounds familiar, it's because it's a repeat. This is the first time I've ever repeated a Lord's Supper lesson that I've done. And it just so happens that this is the very first Lord's Supper lesson I ever did when we first made that change three or so years ago. And the reason I'm repeating it is because it, it makes one of my absolute favorite points to make from Revelation chapter 1, which is where we're going to end our, our study this morning, especially when you are studying with somebody who doesn't really believe that Jesus is God and their struggle with his divinity. There's something powerful in Revelation 1 where we'll end up. But in Psalm 8, it says this in verses 1 through 4, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth, who have displayed your splendor above the heavens. From the mouth of infants and nursing babes you have established strength because of your adversaries to make the enemy and the revengeful cease. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man? that you take thought of him, and the son of man, that you care for him. Consider the work of God's hands with me for a moment this morning. Let's consider the size of the universe that God created. The moon is 240,000 miles away from the earth. Now, if you can imagine there being a highway to the moon, let's say on that highway, you're allowed to drive 100 miles per hour. That would be so fun. 100 miles per hour, and you wouldn't get to sleep. You, you would drive for 24 hours a day for 100 miles an hour. It would take you over three and a half months to get to the moon. Now, if you drive the speed limit and you actually sleep, <laughs> you're going to be over a year to get there. Now, consider that the sun is almost 400 times farther away from us than the moon. 93 million miles away from the Earth. Now imagine a scaled down model on a piece of paper, and I wrote this, I drew this a little bit bigger, but the sun being the size of a period at the end of a sentence. This, this is the sun. If that is the sun, then that means the Earth which is 93 million miles away from the sun, is about an eighth of an inch away from this dot on the paper. Pluto is about a foot away from the sun. And the nearest star system is a half a mile away from this dot. If we were to consider just our galaxy, just our galaxy compared to the size of the sun being the size of a period, our galaxy is the size of, of the Pacific Ocean. The size of our universe is almost unfathomable to the human brain. Yet this is the work of God. And when the psalmist considers how truly great God is, he asks this all important question, how in the world can you care so much about us? If the sun to God is like the size of a period <laughs> at the end of a sentence. How much smaller are we? One translation of Psalm 8.4 reads, What are mere mortals that you should think about them? Human beings that you should care for them. In 1969, when the Apollo 11 landed on the moon, they were sent with a small silicon micro disk containing messages of goodwill from leaders around the world, from um, former U.S. presidents, from 70, uh, leaders from 73 different countries from around the world, and they were to plant this disc on the moon for posterity's sake. An inscription from President Nixon on this disc said this, the journey of the astronauts inspires us, and at the same time, they teach us true humility. What could bring home to us more the limitations of the human scale than the hauntingly beautiful picture of our Earth seen from the moon? 
If you've ever seen those pictures of our earth from the moon, you know exactly what he's talking about. From the moon, we just seem so distant. From the moon, we seem so insignificant, so small. Yet think of the smallness of the earth within the scope of the entire universe. And think of the smallness of the earth in the scope of the God who created the universe. And in addition to the messages from presidents and 73 other world leaders, the Vatican actually got involved, and they submitted a message of their own written on that disc, for which I commend them on this act. It was the entire eighth psalm. Psalm 8 was the first biblical text to reach the moon. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth, who have displayed your splendor above the heavens. What is man that you take thought of him and the son of man that you care for him? What I want to do now is explore the greatness, the majesty, the, the bigness, if that's a word, of God in several different scriptures. Look with me in Isaiah 40, Isaiah chapter 40. In Isaiah 40, you should look at this verse in verse 12. Isaiah 40 in verse 12. It asks a question about God. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and marked off the heavens by the span and calculated the dust of the earth by the measure and weighed the mountains in a balance and the hills in a pair of scales. You know, we've all heard that the earth is 70, made of 70% water. Well, somebody did the math and found that there are 326 million trillion gallons of water on the earth. That, that hurts my brain. <laughs> But Isaiah says God holds all 326 million trillion gallons in the palm of his hand. Somebody did the math on the grains of sand on the earth, and the number is 7 quintillion 500 quadrillion grains. I don't even know what that means. <laughs> but God knows every speck of dust and every piece of sand on the earth. These giant, these mountains that we just look up in all at he just he just puts them on a scale and weighs them and like they're nothing even the greatest most powerful nations empires in the world like the egyptian empire the the babylonian empire the roman empire and, and even now in, in modern day america listen to what god says about these great powerful nations that seem like they can't be stopped look in verse 15 same chapter Behold, the nations are like a drop from a bucket and are regarded as a speck of dust on the scales. Behold, he, he lifts up the islands like fine dust. <laughs> Most powerful nations on earth, there's specks of dust to God. It's like a little drop coming out of a, a bucket of water. The islands, he just, those islands, they're like specks of dust to him too in size. Look at Isaiah 44. In verse 6, Isaiah 44, in verse 6, thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, Isaiah 44, 6, in his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last, and there is no God besides me. He is, he is eternal. He stands outside time and history. He created history. He set history in motion, and he will also end history, and he knows how history is going to end. Look in Ezekiel 43. Ezekiel 43. Ezekiel has a vision of God's glory coming out from the temple. Ezekiel 43, verse 2. Ezekiel 43, in verse 2, says, Behold, the glory of the God of Israel was coming from the way of the east, and his voice was like the sound of many waters, and the earth shone with his glory. So the, the sound of God's voice is like the sound of many waters. If you've ever been to the, to the Niagara Falls, right? The Willinghams are here this morning. You can ask them all about their travels and the, the different waterfalls that they've seen. When, when you hear the sound of a giant waterfall. It, you're not just hearing the sound, you feel 
the sound deep in your bones. This is the voice of God. And his glory is so bright, it fills the entire earth. The, the whole earth shines with his brightness. Look with me in Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7, <clears throat> verses 7 and 9. Daniel 7, verses 9 and 10, I think is what I meant to say. Verses 9 and 10 of Daniel 7. Verse 9, I kept looking until thrones were set up, and the Ancient of Days took his seat, and his vesture, or clothing, was like white snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was ablaze with flames. Its wheels were a burning fire. A river of fire was flowing and coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands were attending him, and myriads upon myriads were standing before him, and the court sat, and the books were open. God is the ancient of days, meaning he is the oldest to ever exist. He is eternal. He has clothing white as snow to symbolize his purity. His hair is white as wool to symbolize his wisdom and the honor that is due to him. He sits on a throne in his majesty, and all this flame imagery is about his power to judge the wicked nations. A river of fire flows out from before him, and a countless multitude of heavenly beings, under which human beings in Scripture, even in the midst of just one heavenly being, human beings flee and cower in fear. And all these heavenly beings are surrounding God, worshiping him, giving him this incredible honor that he deserves. And, and again, whenever, whenever people saw even just small glimpses of the glory of God, whether in a vision or whether they, they looked upon one of his angelic beings, they would be rendered speechless and often fall on their faces. Look in Daniel 10. Daniel 10, verses 8 and 9 here. Daniel sees one of these heavenly beings, and it says in verse 8 and 9, So I was left alone and saw this great vision, yet no strength was left in me, for my natural color turned to a deathly pallor, and I retained no strength. But I heard the sound of his words, and as soon as I heard the sound of his words, I fell into a deep sleep on my face, with my face to the ground. Earlier we read from... Ezekiel 43 in, in verse 2. Well, in the very next verse, in verse 3, after seeing that glory, he says, when I saw it, I fell on my face. The point is, God, God is just so big. He's so majestic and glorious. He is the great I am, the first and the last. And here's where I want to end this morning is by taking us now to Revelation 1. Revelation 1. And what I want you to notice is that all of that glorious language that we read that was talking about God the Father in the Old Testament is here in Revelation 1 applied to Jesus. And what's neat is it's kind of a surprise, actually, especially if you're studying with a group who might disagree that Jesus is God. If you start reading in Revelation 1 and verse 12, you don't tell them the secret. You just, you just start reading and you ask them, who is this talking about? And they will tell you, it's talking about God the Father. Until they come to the place where we're going to end, which shatters that view completely and proves that this is talking about Jesus. But look in Revelation 12, or excuse me, Revelation 1, verse 12. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking with me. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the middle of the lampstand, I saw one like a son of man clothed in a robe, reaching to the feet and girded across his chest with a golden sash. His head and his hair were white, like white wool, like snow. And his eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze when it has been made to glow in a furnace. And his voice was like the sound of many waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars. And out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. And his face was like the sun shining in its strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. And he placed his right hand on me saying, Do not be afraid. I am the first 
and the last. So again, you, you pause right here. If you stop right here and you say, who is this talking about? He says he's the first and the last. His voice sounds like the voice of, of many waters. His eyes are flaming fire. He has white hair like wool. And anybody who's read the Old Testament will say, well, that's talking about the Father, obviously. That's Daniel 7. That's Ezekiel 43. That's all those passages. But now here's the problem. And here's, to me, one of the most powerful points in the entire Bible. Verse 18 I'm the living one, and I was dead. And behold, I'm alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and of Hades. Now, I understand. The second part of this verse talks about the resurrection. But can we just pause and let these three words from God sink in for a moment? I was dead. So this whole passage is talking about God the Father. How in the world did God die? The one true God, the creator of the entire universe who holds the 326 million trillion gallons of water in his hand and the seven quintillion, 500 quadrillion grains of sand in his hand and all the specks of dust and all the things on the atomic level that we can't even see with the human eye and all the stars and planets and galaxies, he created it all. He sustains it all and holds it all in his hands and he died. <laughs> How in the world is that possible? Under what possible circumstance would the greatest being there ever was or ever will be, have died? Well, it's because this is talking about Jesus, who is just as much God as his Father, which is why he can be described using the exact same language as the description of his Father in Scripture. He voluntarily came to this tiny speck of earth, and he lived a life of poverty and rejection and ultimately humiliation and the worst possible death imaginable on a cross to save us. What is man that you take thought of him and the son of man that you care for him? God not only took thought of us, he died for us. He not only cared for us, he loved us with a love deeper than we can ever comprehend. If, we, if you think those numbers about the gallons of water on the earth and the, the grains of sand on the earth are hard to comprehend, those come nothing close to the measurement of God's love that he has for us. God's love is a quintillion, quadrillion kind of love. Proven on a cross. Where the greatest being that ever was and ever will be was willing to die for you and for me. So as we partake of the Lord's Supper this morning, let's remember how small we are on the grand scale of the universe and remember that God didn't treat us like we were small at all. In fact, God treated us like we were the most important thing in the universe to him. And so let's commit this morning to treating God like he is the most important thing in the universe to us.